Welcome to the Belly Button Window channel and episode 16 of the Jimi Hendrix story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we examine November 1967, including the second UK tour, reviews, photo sessions, and the critical events for that month. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. For the Jimi Hendrix experience, November 1967 brought no let up on the touring front, and after having just completed the recording and mixing for the Axis album, the pressure now started to begin the next LP. However, with one difference now. Noel summed it up best this way Each new LP meant new material, which we could no longer polish live in front of an audience before recording, as the crowds now demanded the tried and tested, and for us, the boring hits. The 1st and 2nd of November saw the group, or more accurately, Jimi Hendrix, Chaz Chandler, and Eddie Kramer at Olympic Studios, remixing side one of the Axis album, the master tape to which Jimi had lost the evening before, which just happened to be Halloween, the 31st of October. Upon completion, and with a release date in Britain, set for December 1st, 1967, Chandler and Hendrix personally deliver the master tapes to track records. November 3rd to 6th. Presumably, given no records seemed to exist, the group enjoyed a well-deserved four-day break. Tuesday, November 7th, so the group meets at Chaz Chandler's and Hendrix's shared apartment at 43 Upper Barclay Street in London to assess the test pressing of the new Axis LP. According to Noel, We sat down at Chaz's to hear the test pressing. It sounded good. Also that day, while at the apartment, David Montgomery photographs the experience. Wednesday, November 8th, performing at Manchester University Students' Union in Manchester, Lancashire, supported by Tamla Express and DJ The Baron. The performance setlist was Stone Free, Hey Joe, The Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, The Burning of the Midnight Lamp, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. The day also included an interview with the student magazine in the Union Guest Room by Steve Barker, titled my November 1967 interview with Jimi Hendrix, Barker provides the following introduction. In November 1967, whilst at Keele University, I was involved in the student magazine called Unit Edited by Tony Elliott, who was to go on to found Time Out. I suggested a Hendrix piece, as the Jimi Hendrix experience was due to play at Manchester University Students Union. In the period since the first interview, Jimi had become a megastar, and was packing in audiences up and down the country and into Europe. I travelled to Manchester with some friends, and we made our way to the gig. <sighs> On arriving, I found the dressing room packed with people, including Mitch and Noel, but no Jimmy. I asked where he was, and someone said, Check next door. I entered the room to find Jimmy alone, leaning on a radiator next to a window about 15 or 20 feet across the room. He looked up and said, Hello, Steve. How are you? I didn't think much about it at the time, but soon after, on reflection, I appreciated this as the mark of the man. Since I'd met him nine months previously, Jimmy had experienced incredible success, meaning fan adulation, and had accrued all the trappings of what was to become the rock star lifestyle. Hangers on, sycophancy, pressure, and freely available narcotics, etc. But he still remembered my name and behaved like a perfect gentleman which is the way I always remember him. Steve asks, You write all of your own material. Where does it come from? Jimmy replies, Just from me. It's like, uh, where does it come from? I'm not sure. Like, we go to clubs a lot and all around, riding in taxis, and you happen to see a lot of things. You see everything, experience everything as you live. Even if you're living in a little room, you see a lot of things if you have imagination. The songs just come... Steve quotes a line from Jimmy's Burning of the Midnight Lamp. Loneliness is such a drag. To which Jimmy says, That's what it is. It really is sometimes. That was the song I liked best of all we did. I'm glad it didn't make it big and get thrown around. Steve, does this mean you're an introvert? Jimmy answers, Well, sometimes. Right then when I wrote Midnight Lamp I was, but really I have to catch myself and find out. I was feeling kind of down like that. So you go on into different moods, and when you write, your mood comes through. So you can go back and listen to your own records and know how you were feeling then and how your moods change at different times. 
Then Steve states, Loneliness is such a drag is a kind of whispery, quiet thing. How come you put these words in among powerful, extroverted music? Jimmy's reply, I like to play loud. I always did like to play loud. The words of the song just come. They mean a lot, but I don't know how they come out. It starts off very quiet until we get into it. Steve, do you ever feel like going away and sorting yourself out like Bob Dylan did? To which Jimmy replies, I think that's going to have to happen soon anyway, because everyone's getting so tired. You work so hard sometimes and it gets to be really frustrating. Steve asks, does this mean you write primarily for yourself? Oh, definitely. One song we did called I Don't Live Today was dedicated to the American Indian and all minority depression groups. All I did was just use a few words and they said, what does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. Yuck, because it was only three or four lines in there anyway. Steve, you said the love bit wouldn't last. Looks like you're going to be right. And Jimmy states that this seems like bells and everything and all those little pseudo hippies running around flashing their little love not war badges. Those kind won't last because they're going to hop on the next train, any train, that comes close to them and is easy to hop. But you don't really know anymore what a hippie is supposed to be. Question. Is stage work still the most important part of your scene? To which Jimmy answers. Well, tonight I was so frustrated, man. We just couldn't get it together because we haven't been playing in so long. We've been working on the LP. If we did those songs now, they'd miss half the words because the PA went out and we were playing so loud so it wouldn't mean nothing to them if we did our new songs. Now we got to wait till the LP comes out. Then we can interpret them so much better. It's so frustrating now. We're playing the same old songs, and they expect you to do this and do that, and then your guitar gets out of tune, and you don't get a chance to play well. I don't like laying around. I like to play all the time. Steve, what do you do it all for anyway? Jimmy's reply. I like to be involved, and I like music, the same old story, all that goody-goody stuff. Music is a love to me. I love it, and the people are so nice. In a strained, sarcastic voice, the money's great, too. Steve asks, what are you trying to do with your new LP? Jimmy replies, I really can't say. It's very hard to explain your own type of music to somebody. Unless you have a very definite idea of where you're going, it doesn't really make any difference which direction you choose as long as you're really honest about the songs you write. Steve, how big a part do visuals play in your stage work? Jimmy says as follows. You just do it when you feel like it sometimes. I didn't feel like leaping about tonight too much. I used to feel I had to do it, but not anymore. Man, you'd have a heart attack if you were doing it every night like we were doing it two or three months ago. We'd be dead by this time. Anyway, you can't do it right unless you feel it. Half of the things I do, I don't even know it because I just felt like it at the time. If you have everything planned out and one little thing goes wrong, you think, Oh no! What am I supposed to be doing now? Oh yeah, I'm supposed to be going like this. Do 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 do. Hi everybody, I'm doing it. So you'd really be in a world of trouble if one little thing goes wrong. Friday, November 10th, at 10 o'clock in the morning, Jimmy, Mitch, Noel plus road manager, Jerry Stickles, depart by plane from London to Amsterdam. This was the second visit of the Jimi Hendrix experience to Holland. TV recordings, Vita Studio, Busum. Immediately after arriving at Schiphol Airport near Amsterdam, the trio drove to the Vita Studio for the recordings of the TV program Hopla. The Jimi Hendrix Experience recorded Foxy Lady, Catfish Blues and Purple Haze twice. Peter Neuwerf, who worked for Polydor and met the band at the airport, recalled, The only thing I remember is that Jimmy wasn't very warmly dressed, and they didn't have any instruments with them. Maybe someone else took care of that. I picked them up and brought them to the studio. Thereafter, I didn't see them again. Jimmy didn't say much. You could not really get close. But he was an extraordinarily kind and gentle being. Absolutely. Jules Dielder, a.k.a. Julian the Joint, remembered, I just came back from the toilet into the canteen and instantly noticed from the change of atmosphere that he, Jimi Hendrix, was there, and his roadie came up to me and asked whether I would like to talk to Jimmy for a minute because of the way I looked, you know. Jules had a frizzed head of hair a la Jimmy at the time. That man, Hendrix, came straight from London and that was the Mecca. And well, I got into a conversation with that guy, my goodness. It was like if we'd known each other for years. Rosalie Peters, who was also present at the canteen, 
and would later announce the JHE on TV, perceived some young men with slim hips and nice-looking afros. Rosalie recalled, It all went very cool. Everything went a l'improviste. That was also the intended atmosphere to foster a certain absurdity. One of the Hopla producers, Wim van der Linden, was also present at the recordings. He gave a live performance, incredibly loud, but we told him to. Wim van der Linden went on to describe Jimmy as a terrible nice guy, not at all arrogant, really nice and gentle. Rosalie Peters also confirms this impression. He came across as very soft-hearted. After all those wild stories about the Jimi Hendrix experience, a trail of destruction, first-class riffraff, he made a very lovable impression. He gave me a box of chocolates. Harmless affection. A really sweet guy. Leo Riemans, journalist of the right-wing newspaper De Telegraph, on the whole, really wasn't enthusiastic about Hopla and about Jimi Hendrix in particular. In the issue of the 24th of November 1967, Leo described the performance as an enormous display of tastelessness and musical impotence. One of them tried to eat his guitar. I argue that not only Hopla and that filthy fan club, another Dutch TV program, and all those manifestations of complete negativism should disappear. For which young people is all this actually meant? Jimmy in Rotterdam, according to noted Hendrix biographer and researcher, Yeza Glebeek. After the TV recordings, the group ate French fried potatoes across the street from the Vitus studio. Thereafter, around five o'clock, they left by car for Rotterdam and checked in at Hotel Central. Early in the evening, they went off in the direction of the old Ahoy complex. There, the hippie happy market was being held. There were about 40 stands lined up with all kinds of interesting stuff for the swinging teenager. From clothes and records to coin-operated amusements and motorbikes. In other words, a warehouse for teenagers. The musical program for this five-day market event included, among others, Pink Floyd, the Bee Gees, and the Jimi Hendrix Experience, and various Dutch acts. The warm-up acts were The Flowers and The Motions. One of the musicians in The Motions was Gerard Romain, who had this to say. We had a silly act. We hired some farmers' marching band to do something different, you know. We couldn't match that Hendrix anyway, only that sound to begin with. So we decided to play a little joke. Backstage? Well, we had a room next to Jimmy, but you didn't walk in just like that. One very much looked up to a man like him. I could have probably done so, you know, but I didn't dare to. And also, the relationship between Dutch and English bands was very different in those days. Paul Ackett, who saw Jimmy play in England long before most people in Holland had ever heard of him, booked all the bands for the Hippie Happy event. The experience played for £374. According to Ackett, the contracting went very easy at that time. However, it wasn't so easy to get him on the programme in Rotterdam. They never had heard of the man before. Special conditions? No, nothing like that, not at all. It was just some paper with the date, hall, time and wages, that's all. This wasn't only for Jimi Hendrix, but for all the groups at that time. They were glad if you gave them a bottle of beer, so to speak. Nothing like champagne or whiskey in the dressing rooms, those were good times. And a silly and false rumour was spread around that Jimmy went missing 45 minutes before the concert and he found him in a house with open door in bed with some girl, blah blah blah, but it was fake news. Instead Jimmy had dinner in Hotel Central and after that took a nap in his room in Hotel Central, alone. Rob Bosboom, photographer, woke Jimmy up, took some images and after that, Jimmy went at 9 p.m. over to the Ahoy Hall for his show. The Experience concert started at 10.05 p.m. Jimmy took up his usual position on the left side of the stage, behind him four 100-watt Marshall stacks, plus two Stratocasters and the Gibson Flying V lined up in front of the speakers. According to Jules Dielder, the atmosphere was fantastic. Man, there wasn't a place left for a chicken. Next to me sits a person for whom it was the highlight of his life. I can still remember I arrived at the side of the stage and saw in front of me an immense crowd. It was so crowded, man. Well, yeah, that hall was so big, maybe in the back, but my impression was that it was totally packed. To put things in perspective, I had the pleasure of having a grand view as I was standing right in front of the stage. There were 3,000 people watching the experience, and nobody moved an inch back. Behind me, there were loads of fans flashing away like mad with their little amateur cameras, and I vividly recall even a person shooting some 8mm film. 
The following songs were performed. Stone Free, Manic Depression. The Dutch newspaper Het Vrije Volk called this a man of depression in their concert review. Hey Joe, a number from the Axis, Bold as Love. LP, possibly Little Miss Lover. The Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, The Burning of the Midnight Lamp, and Purple Haze, including the teeth act and testing a martial amp for durability via Jimmy's attacking white fender strat. The newspapers were reacting with enthusiastic reviews, whereas the atmosphere was described as lacking, mainly due to the neon lights used in the hall, the concert was great. Alternative music paper Hit Week concluded in their piece published on the 24th of November with... He lets his guitar sing, groan and scream, but keeps it all under his control. Mitch gave a drum solo, compared to which Ginger Baker's cream work grows pale, while bass player Noel played more like a solo guitarist. In short, it caused goosebumps. After the concert, the experience went quickly back to Hotel Central. There was a get-together in Jimmy's room with Julian the Joint. No points for guessing how he got his name. Rosalie Peters wasn't permitted to go upstairs. I had to wait in the lounge while Jules was boozing upstairs. It just wasn't allowed for a woman to go in Jimmy's room. I made a big fuss and then we all went over to our place. Dilda. Yes, those watchdogs, presumably referring to some chaperones hired by Paul Ackett, the promoter, were constantly there. Jimmy said, I don't like having those guys on my ass." So I said, then come along to my place. There you can do whatever you want to. Upon arriving at the little house, it seemed to be packed with people. Where they came from is even now a mystery for Jules. But everybody knew Jimmy would be there. There were drinks and some smokes. According to Noel, he nearly pulled Rosalie Peters. Ah, those boys are the experience, says Rosalie. They were so drunk and stoned. They were just sitting on the stairs. They staggered into a taxi. Jimmy stayed the whole night. Jules played Charlie Parker and Art Pepper LPs. He thought it was just fine that I didn't have any of his records. Rosalie. There was a lady, Wilhelmina, who I don't know how long was hanging around Hotel Central and around our door. Finally we let her in. She spent the night with him. We didn't hear a thing. That still surprises me. Jules and I slept in a single bed and they slept in the room next to ours. Only a curtain separated those little rooms. Saturday, the 11th of November. Peter DeWitt, one of Paul Ackett's watchdogs, stormed the house of Rosalie and Jules, but the bird had already flown. All night long, DeWitt and the other watchdogs had been desperately looking for their man until they found out that Jimmy was with Rosalie and Jules. Rosalie, we did put Jimmy in a taxi with a raisin bun, and no more than five minutes later that watchdog stood in front of our door totally in panic. Where was Jimmy? At last they found out where the golden chicken was. At 10.45 in the morning, Jimmy, Mitch and Noel left from Hotel Central to go to Skiphole Airport. At precisely one o'clock in the afternoon, their feet left Dutch soil, never to return again. Saturday, November 11th, so the group performing at the new refectory, Sussex University, Brighton, England, supported by 10 years after, the experience earning £500 10 years after, £60. Noel recalled, One of the worst gigs we ever did. Should have missed it. Everyone was terrible. Left town immediately. Remembering the day grumpy Jimi Hendrix rocked University of Sussex, while hundreds of students rocked out at the concert, one gig-goer was left underwhelmed by Hendrix's performance describing Jimmy as appearing distracted at the show. He said, He seemed very grumpy and didn't play for long. He came on late, too. Perhaps he got caught in crosstown traffic getting to the venue, adding, He didn't stay on stage long because he didn't seem to be enjoying it. Apparently he didn't play a full set, and I don't know exactly why. Another member of the audience said Hendrix was in a bad mood, and kept sticking his tongue out at the audience. Despite the apparently disappointing gig, everyone at the university was thrilled to see Hendrix play, as he was considered a god, summed up by one member of the audience as follows. We were still pleased to see him here, but we realized he hadn't been in the best of humor. Sunday, November 12th. Rehearsals at Regent Sound Studios, 4 Denmark Street, West End, London, as opposed to the usual Olympic Studios. Also that day, the band had a photo shoot with noted photographer Bruce Fleming. Monday, November 13th. Back at Olympic Studios, London, and... The experienced band members get their hair cut at Gary Craze's Sweeney Todd Barbershop in London. From the 14th of November until the 5th of December, 1967, the Jimi Hendrix Experience undertake their second tour of the UK, 
a package tour headlining the bill with supporting acts. The move, Pink Floyd, Iman Corner, the nice outer limit and air apparent, who were signed to Mike Jeffrey and Chaz Chandler and were road managed by Dave Robinson, later of Stiff Records. The experience performed 31 shows in 16 cities, comprising larger venues such as theatres and halls, in order to accommodate larger audiences owing to their growing popularity. The UK tour started out on Tuesday the 14th at the Royal Albert Hall, London. Earlier in the day, the group is interviewed by Valerie Wilmer for Hit Parade, published January 1968, and Downbeat Magazine, published on April 4th, 1968. Noel commented, Standing in the Albert Hall for the first gig, it hit us like a ton of bricks just how big we were, only after 14 months. A Rolls-Royce had delivered us to the gig. The dressing rooms were ultra-plush. Chaz offered his stage fright cure of whiskey and coke, the liquid kind, to anyone who looked vaguely worried. We weren't nervous, just sobered by the thought of the venue. We played it being a bit blasé. The concert set list, Foxy Lady, Fire. Hey Joe, The Burning of the Midnight Lamp, Spanish Castle Magic, The Wind Cries Mary, and Purple Haze. Here is an excerpt from a review of the show by Nick Logan, which appeared in the November 18th issue of New Musical Express. Hail Jimi Hendrix, the personality, the contortionist, the wisecracker, the exhibitionist. Hail Noel Redding and Mitch Mitchell, his traumatic experience. How they were needed to close the package which opened up at London's Albert Hall. The bill seemed as if it would never get off the ground. Thank goodness for Hendrix the untamed and the unchained swinging down from the trees through Knightbridge and Kensington to set the masses on fire in an ectoplasma of sound. Most of all, it was Hendrix the showman, the king-size personality. And that was just what the rest of the group tour of first-timers lacked. Personality. A worthwhile tour for Hendrix fans, but let's hope the rest improve a little as it progresses and an excerpt from a piece by Chris Welch in the November 25th issue of Melody Maker. The Hendrix Move Tour thundered off on its trip round Britain with a deafening start. The Floyd gave one of their colourful and deafening displays of musical pyrotechnics, and indeed, all the groups were painfully loud. The era apparent practically damaged my hearing system for life. The Nice, my favourite group, blew their cool. The Amen Corner raved like a show band, and the move thundered along in a shower of flowers in the rain. Jimmy was great and deserved the ovation, but really, Mitch and Noel shouldn't make announcements. Sorry, lads, but Jimmy sounds better with the chat. According to Saucerful of Secrets, the Pink Floyd Odyssey book, at each gig, the headlining Hendrix was allotted exactly 40 minutes. The move, who preceded him on stage, had just half an hour, and the Floyd was expected to sum up what they were all about in precisely 17 minutes. As the tour wore on, Barrett appeared increasingly morose and depressed. Jimi Hendrix, unaware as almost everyone else of the underlying seriousness of Sid's condition, took to addressing him ironically as laughing Sid Barrett. Hugh Nolan's review of the concert for Disc magazine highlighted how much the pop scene in Britain had changed in the year or so since Jimmy had come to Britain and in becoming successful, how much a part Jimmy had played in turning the music business around. Way back in 1966, a bill consisting of the Jimi Hendrix experience, the move in the Pink Floyd would probably have little impact, but on Tuesday last week exactly that bill packed the vast Royal Albert Hall. A funny thing, Pop, isn't? Hendrix, it seems, can do no wrong. His hysterically exciting act provides what must be the most crashing, soulful, thrilling finale any pop bill could hope for, short of perhaps the Beatles, who don't play on pop bills anymore. The Albert Hall seemed packed with nothing but Hendrix fans. There were honourable mentions for Mitch and Noel, but it was Jimmy the crowd was screaming for, and it was Jimmy they got, doing every trick he knows, and always managing to produce very beautiful sounds. Mitch had this to say. In a way, the tour was more absurd than the previous one, because none of the bands on this one was package tour material. It was actually good fun. Lunacy most of the time, however. Sid Barrett, who was still with Pink Floyd, didn't talk to anyone during that time. In fact, David Gilmore, who was Sid's replacement, joined the tour halfway through. It was the headline act. It was a demonstration of the rock tour as big business, paving the way for the future of the rock music landscape of the 1970s and 80s. Noel made just this observation. As guaranteed earners, our fees were now on a percentage basis, 
and we could pull up and come in groups along with us. Chaz and Jeffrey pulled efforts with Robert Stigwood and Rick Gunnell for tour purposes. The rock tour was now big business, group discounts for travel, hotels, shared advertising and publicity expenses. All this meant less trouble and more profit. Wednesday, November 15th, saw an appearance on the Good Evening TV program, ATV, at the Mayfair Hotel London, and included a filmed interview with Jonathan King. Later, Winter Gardens, Bournemouth, Hampshire, performing for two shows, Thursday, November 16th, photo session by photographer David Montgomery for the Sunday Times at the Roundhouse, Chalk Farm Road, London. The photo shoot took place in the afternoon with Jimmy against a wall and a smoky atmosphere. The images would later be used for the UK Electric Ladyland inner gatefold sleeve. David Montgomery was also the photographer responsible for the naked females photograph initially used on the UK Electric Ladyland LP cover an image which Hendrix had no involvement in and reportedly disliked, apparently stating that it reminded him of a bad U.S. groupie sex party he'd been in. The date of the photo session with the naked females is unknown. The photographer David Montgomery only gives 1967 as the date. However, Hendrix researchers tend to think that this photo session likely took place either on November 16th or in December of 1967. Friday, November 17th, City Hall, Sheffield, Yorkshire, performing two shows. Noel Redding recorded in his diary. Sheffield was terribly enthusiastic about us, and we got torn apart coming out of the hall, losing clothing, glasses, hair. I always wondered what would happen if the detachables and semi-detachables like hair ran out. While an unknown reporter for the Sheffield Star noted, like an electrified gollywog, Jimi Hendrix threw himself into a live wire act that featured his intricate guitar interpretation. Quite an experience. Saturday, November 18th. The Empire, Liverpool, Lancashire, performing two shows. Here is an account from Tim Finn, who was present that evening. On this day in 1967, I witnessed a spectacle. At the age of 14, I went along to this show to see a live performance by the Jimi Hendrix experience. They were top of the bill but were supported by a stellar list of groups. The atmosphere grew as each act played their set, and it was the penultimate act, The Move, that made me ask myself, can Jimi Hendrix be any better than this? The compere Pete Drummond walked onto the stage and announced that due to unforeseen circumstances, the experience would not be appearing, and simply walked off, to the sound of much booing. At that point, the theatre was plunged into darkness, and everyone fell silent. Then, the very faint sound of one note being held on the guitar. A single spotlight from the back of the theatre suddenly focused on the vibrato holding that note. The one note grew louder until it became feedback. As Jimmy's hands went down the fretboard, he roared into Foxy Lady. The lights went up and the audience went berserk. It was amazing and I feel so lucky to have been in the presence of a genius. Sunday, November 19th, the Coventry Theatre Coventry performing two shows. The Jimi Hendrix Experience plays, among others, the following songs. Hey Joe, The Wind Cries Mary, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. The following piece appeared in the Coventry Evening Telegraph the next day. Pop's new wave splashed into Coventry, and on the crest of it was the Jimi Hendrix Experience, one of the most exciting happenings since the Beatles. More than 3,000 youngsters attended two houses at the Coventry Theatre, and a good proportion rushed the stage and shouted for more at the climax of the group's act. Jimmy mixed Pop's new sounds with the rawest of blues, uninhibited showmanship, and a brilliant musical technique. He can play guitar with his teeth, lying on the stage or behind his back, and do it better than most in a more conventional position. The result was a stunning, completely individual performance which included hits like Hey Joe, The Wind Cries Mary, and Purple Haze and the wildest version yet of Wild Thing. But the teenagers who stood on their seats for Jimi Hendrix were unmoved, and I guess somewhat bewildered, by the Pink Floyd, a group for whom the new wave is more of a spring tide. After the shows, the bands stay at the Hotel Leofric in Coventry. On Wednesday, 22nd of November, the experience plays the Guildhall in Portsmouth for two shows. Songs for the first show, Fire, Stone Free, Hey Joe, Purple Haze, The Wind Cries Mary, and Wild Thing. The following piece by Spinner appeared in the Portsmouth Evening News the next day. Pop music is a horrible noise, a cacophony of over-amplified guitars and tone-deaf singers, so might a critic picked at random say. 
Last night at Portsmouth Guildhall, four of Britain's leading groups went a long way to persuading 3,000 youngsters that such an anti-pop opinion could be right after all. Never has a pop show been so deafening and so lacking in variety and good presentations. The exception was the start of the show, Jimi Hendrix, as loud as any of the others, but twice as talented and a superb showman. He crouched, he leapt, he did a somersault. But still he played that guitar with one hand, two hands, his teeth, his forearm, and his hips. The remorseless roar of his guitar, coupled with bass player Noel Redding and drummer Mitch Mitchell, formed a crude and earthy blues style, which made the other group seem dull. From someone who attended the first show, I can't exactly remember in what order Jimmy played his set, but he started with Fire and definitely ending with Wild Thing. Jimmy also played The Wind Cries Mary, which Mitch Mitchell came forward to introduce. I remember Jimmy saying in between one number, we don't want no clowning around out there, we're the only ones allowed to clown around. His guitar was mainly a white Stratocaster with rosewood neck and a multicolored scratch plate. A really smart looking guitar. The other guitar on stage was a battered red Strat, which he only used for Wild Thing. He completed his set by throwing the guitar over the top of the Marshall stacks, where it was duly caught by a roadie standing behind. Obviously it was intended to do quite a few more concerts before finally becoming unusable, and there you have it. It was a good performance, and it will always remain a treasured memory of my teenage years. On Thursday, November 23rd, the group plays the Sophia Gardens Pavilion, Cardiff, Glamorgan, Wales, two shows. Setlist for the second show, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. The following piece appeared in the Cardiff Press. On Thursday, the 23rd of November, 1967, one of the best tour packages of the era rolled into Cardiff, featuring Jimi Hendrix and a cast of some of the biggest British bands of the time. The Jimi Hendrix experience had played earlier in the year at Cardiff's Capital Theatre, low down on a bill featuring the Walker Brothers, Cat Stevens and Engelbert Humperdinck. In the intervening months, they had played at the Monterey Pop Festival, which had brought the Seattle guitarist wide recognition. Now Hendrix was at the head of a bill at the Cardiff Sophia Gardens Pavilion, which featured The Move, a rock band who metamorphosed into the Electric Light Orchestra, Pink Floyd, still with Sid Barrett, The Nice, a prog rock band who would become Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Cardiff's own Amen Corner, and two other smaller bands called Era Apparent and The Outer Limits. The event took the form of two shows, one at 6.15pm and another at 8.35pm, with all the bands squeezed into a time slot that headline bands would take for themselves these days. Amen Corner had had a couple of hits in the year before this show, but were yet to have their smash hits Bend Me, Shape Me and If Paradise Is, Half As Nice. The band's Alan Jones recalls, I reckon the first two bands would have got ten minutes each, can you believe that? Then the nice would have been fifteen then us with twenty minutes, then the move. Then there's a break for another twenty minutes, and Hendrix would have got half an hour, that's all. There were a lot of good bands on there. It was a great diverse bill. The Floyd were very cool, the Nice were also very cool. There was us and the move, and then Hendrix at the top. It was a heck of a bill. It appealed to a lot of people, not just Hendrix fans. He was the star, there's no question about that. But as a bill, it's surprising it worked so well. The gig was sold out with up to 4,000 rock fans crammed into the venue. Among the crowd were young ladies who got a little more than they paid for. Renowned journalist Nick Kent, in his biography Apathy for the Devil, says, The best bill I've ever witnessed. Four mind-boggling performances. There was a sexual bravado about Hendrix Live that night that was so palpable it made my jaw drop. One local girl in the audience was Pat Mills. I remember the tickets were 12 shillings and sixpence, which for as a schoolgirl was really expensive. There was the local band Amen Corner, and we also wanted to see the other bands like Pink Floyd and The Nice, but in the end, it was Hendrix that everyone went for. We were all intrigued by this guy who played his guitar with his teeth. He played Wild Thing, Purple Haze and Hey Joe, among others. The venue was packed with a great atmosphere. I remember getting a load of autographs and meeting Keith Emerson after the show. Alan Jones remembers that there was something about Hendrix. He was definitely the star. You'd only have to see him once and you'd know. He was phenomenal. He had this persona about him that had never been seen before. He was a mixture of Little Richard, Otis Redding, and as a guitar player, as a package, he had all his roots sorted. 
everything from blues to jazz to psychedelia. Jones was part of a tour that was epoch-making in musical terms. He looks back on the time with great fondness. It was all brilliant. I don't think we had a bad night on that tour. It was just a privilege to be on the bill and to get the chance to finish playing and watch Hendrix twice a night for 30 dates. That's pretty awesome. Something to be thought about and relished. Friday, November 24th. And the experience plays the Colston Hall in Bristol for two concerts, one at 6.30pm and the other at 8.45pm. Earlier that evening, excited and drunk Welsh teenagers had to be evicted after incidents at the auditorium bar. Some other guys from across the Severn Bridge came to support the Welsh band Amen Corner. Screaming like crazy, they insulted the other groups and threatened the security by brandishing stools and bottles. Then there was Pink Floyd and the Nice. The latter for their part destroyed an electric organ and shattered a few thousand pairs of eardrums before being lost in a cloud of coloured smoke. The following piece appeared in the Bristol Evening Post the next day. Following some earlier incidents which did not spoil a triumphant return of Hendrix to the first city to put him into the charts, Jimi Hendrix paid tribute to Bristol over the microphone and then launched into the wildest, noisiest pop music of all. He received a frenzy of applause. Many people today wish they had seen Jimi Hendrix in concert. Malcolm Coates was lucky enough to witness one of the two shows that he played at the Colson Hall. Malcolm, who was 14 years old when he saw Hendrix perform, recalls, the performance made so much of an impression on me that I wrote a review a few months later for my English class. This is an excerpt, taken from Malcolm's review. And then the lights went out, and the Jimi Hendrix experience were introduced. In many places he has been banned. In many places his act has been accused of being obscene and sexy. But nowhere has he been accused of anything but being spectacular. And that night was no exception. He played each one of his three guitars in every possible way. But with his hands, or so it seemed... He played them with his teeth, the stage, his bodyguard's head, a microphone stand and the drum kit. When the last number, Purple Haze, was announced, I thought the end of the world was upon us. On Saturday, the 25th of November, the group plays two shows at the Opera House in Blackpool. Songs performed for the second show, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Fire, Hey Joe, The Wind Cries Mary, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. Peter Neal filmed Purple Haze and Wild Thing during the second show for the film See My Music Talking. And this is how it all came about. According to Austin Mitchell, who had witnessed Hendrix live and even reviewed Hendrix's performance for The Observer, conceded that all the text and pictures that could be created on a page could never even hint at the searing impact of his live performance. So Austin goes on to say, Over the following week I started ringing up my few contacts in film and TV. Somebody should preserve this man's work on film. Mostly I met with a ho-hum. This was still an era when rock music on TV was strictly confined to the top 20 shows like Top of the Pops. Rock had no status as an art form. There was no Rolling Stone. No sort of intelligent context to work in. A colleague of mine on The Observer, Brian Haynes, told me that David Frost's company was thinking of producing some independent music films for TV. Why don't you make a film yourself? I had a friend called Peter Neal, who worked for an independent documentary company, struggling along making low-budget, gritty 16mm movies with a strong left bias. Peter had directed a fine black-and-white film about the Watersons, a traditional a cappella singing group from Yorkshire, poles apart from the hyper-amplified strobe-lit circus of acid rock. But Peter, who played fine bluegrass guitar, was as smitten as I was when I took him to see Hendrix warming up at the Royal Albert Hall for the opening concert of his first headlining UK tour on the 14th of November. Peter cobbled together a budget, and we managed to get a couple of hundred pounds from the Frost organization to make a start. At 1967 prices, this was sufficient to buy some film stock, hire three cameramen, and a sound man, plus equipment and a van for the nine-hour drive north to Blackpool to catch Jimmy on one of his tour dates at Blackpool's Opera House. The cameramen took a look at the early evening show and voted to turn around and go home, since they felt that there was insufficient light to film and the tour's stage manager wouldn't give us any more light. Peter told the cameramen to boost the exposure to the max and pray. The opera house manager had generously given us camera positions in the royal box, in the orchestra pit, and allowed us access to the stage. Meanwhile, the sound man had his problems. No one had ever tried to make a live recording of anything like the volume at which Jimi Hendrix played, 
which was like trying to tape an artillery bombardment. Hendricks gave me a fraternal greeting and told me to watch out for Keith Emerson, playing with one of the support acts. Nice. He's doing everything on keyboards that I do on guitar. We filmed Purple Haze and Wild Thing, the latter badly out of tune up to the second chorus. Back in London, prayers were answered. When the film came back from the labs, we had good takes on all three cameras, and the sound was pretty good. Peter had put together an all-pro crew. Better still, he quickly edited together a rough cut of Wild Thing, which got shown on BBC TV the week that my piece finally appeared in The Observer, on the 6th of December on BBC Two's first colour broadcast, during late night lineup. This was a great encouragement to the backers. While Noel Redding noted in his diary, audience was terrible both shows, but the sound was exceptionally good. Set list for the second show, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Fire, Hey Joe, The Wind Cries Mary, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. The following piece appeared in the Blackpool Evening Gazette a couple of days later. Musical equipment belonging to five top pop groups was damaged by an intruder at the Opera House. After their two performances at the theatre on Saturday night, they left their guitars, amplifiers and electrical equipment on the stage before going to their hotel. When they returned yesterday morning to collect it, they found that leads had been ripped from amplifiers and guitars. Amplifiers had been damaged and one guitar had been trampled on and had its strings cut. They estimated the damage as £350. That concludes episode 13 in this series. Stay tuned for the next installment, where we will examine September 1967 and the Scandinavian tour. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to any related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period, and any updates. Also, don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. By the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Lastly, thank you so much for your wonderful comments and continuing support. Disclaimer. The images and photographs we are displaying are from a different range of sources, such as Pinterest, Tumblr, etc., except when and where noted. If you are the copyright holder and would like them removed or credited, please get in touch. On Sunday, November 26th, The Experience plays two shows at the Palace Theatre in Manchester. Noel Redding writes in his diary, In Manchester... A thin three-fan welcoming committee presented me the gift of please, written 5,000 times. These days the bands weren't the only ones living off a rainbow of diet pills. And, in Manchester, we got stoned in the afternoon and nearly got thrown out of the hotel. On Monday, the 27th of November, the experience plays two shows at the Whitler Hall, Queen's College in Belfast, as part of their Festival 67 program, while Jimmy also celebrates his birthday. Before the shows, Jimmy is given a birthday cake by the festival organization. It was Jimmy's 25th birthday, and this was the only night the Jimi Hendrix experience played in Ireland. Songs performed for the first show, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Fire, Purple Haze, Hey Joe, Foxy Lady, The Wind Cries, Mary and Wild Thing. Song list for the second show, Foxy Lady, Fire, Catfish Blues, The Wind Cries, Mary, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. The following piece appeared in the Belfast Telegraph the next day titled Cool Reception at the Whittler by George Hamilton. The noise being blasted out at the Whittler Hall last night during the Jimi Hendrix concert was the loudest I have ever heard. It was so bad you could feel your insides and even your chair resonating in tune, naturally. The group were fine on record and just as good at reproducing a similar sound in person, but the enormous amplification swamped everything. Their performance received a polite but cool reception. While the Belfast newsletter reported in a piece titled Hendrix was worth bringing, Jimmy received an enthusiastic response from the two 1,000-strong audiences who grasped entirely by this way-out brand of music, obviously exceptionally skillful, if you appreciate that sort of thing. With Noel Redding and drummer Mitch Mitchell, Hendrix captured his audience. 
and this review, published in Gown on the 7th of December by Liam and Roisin McCauley, stated, It is now an acknowledged fact that a pop concert should be ear-splitting and kaleidoscopic. Last week's Jimi Hendrix concert fulfilled both criteria. On stage, amplifiers dwarfed and deafened the performers. In the gallery, frenzied amateurs feverishly juggled with six squares of coloured cellophane and two spotlights. Fifteen hundred people sat in the Whitlaw and waited for their minds to be blown. It was Hendrix's birthday. The audience sang Happy Birthday in a feeble and slightly embarrassed fashion. The compere hurriedly initiated a cry of, We want Jimmy. The lights dimmed and weaved. Hendrix exploded onto the stage. Plug your ears, it's going to be loud. The ensuing welter of noise, confusion and flashing lights could not obscure the fact that Jimi Hendrix is a guitarist of considerable talent, and though it is at times difficult to separate sheer gimmickness from genuine musical Jimi Hendrix, he played the guitar in fifty different positions from the Kama Sutra, made an indecent assault upon the amplifier, and in a final frenetic gesture, smashed a Fender Stratocaster against the wall, having first displayed method in his madness by unplugging it. It was as though he had finally succeeded in identifying the instrument with his own arrogant virility, and subsequently frustrated with the latter, had involved it in the final act of destruction. It is now as important to smash a guitar as it is to play it. Hendrix did both with admirable expertise. Off stage, Hendrix is incongruously mild, affable and unassuming. He sat in the dressing room, temporarily detached from the bevy of road managers and munched birthday cake. He constantly strummed a guitar covered in psychedelic patterns. That concludes episode 16 in this series. Stay tuned for the next installment, where we will examine December 1967 of the Hendrix story. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to any related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period, and any updates. Also, don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. By the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Lastly, thank you so much for your wonderful comments and continuing support.